Um, so my name is Uta Grisama, as uh, Brian, I think, said. Uh, I work for the California Stem Cell Agency, which is uh, headquartered in San Francisco. In uh, 2004, the voters of California approved a proposition to spend uh, $3 billion on stem cell research. And as you probably remember, this was in the climate of the restrictions on uh, funding for stem cell research uh, at the federal level. Um, but so we've been in business for um, quite a few years now, but I'm not here to, uh, to tell you about what uh, CIRM specifically does, CIRM, California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, but just um, to, um, to uh, you know, I love talking about the um, uses, the potential, the current and the potential uses of stem cells. But I felt like in the 15 or 20 minutes that I have, it was more important that I actually explain what stem cells are, but in, because it's very important, of course, to have a basis uh, for discussion, an accurate basis for discussion. So that's what I'm gonna do, talk about what stem cells actually are. Um, I'm happy to be interrupted at any time. I think we have a bit of time um, to uh, slow me down and explain things better if you have questions. And then when I'm done, I can certainly answer uh, many more questions as well. My background is I'm an embryologist uh, by training and I did research in embryology trying to understand how mouse embryos form various organs such as the kidney. But I've now worked for several years for this funding agency and have become really of course fascinated and uh, excited about what stem cells are and what they can do. So what are stem cells? As I said, that's my subject matter today. Um, and I want to first basically just tell you what the definition is, and then I'll go into the different types of stem cells that exist. Um, and before I sh tell you the first um, characteristic of stem cells, I'm going to step one step back and just um, briefly speak about um, cells in general. So I'm assuming you all are aware of the fact that we are made up of um, many, many cells in our body. And these cells in our body, they're called specialized, which means, or differentiated. They have a very specific function to perform in our body. We have hundreds of different cell types. It's an example here of a neuron that's connected um, to other neurons, and its uh, job is, of course, to transmit uh, information from our brain uh, to our spinal cord, for instance. Uh, this is a, an example of a red blood cell, very different cell type, um, and it, uh, um, of course, its job is to carry oxygen from our lungs through our body. And finally here I'm showing um, actually a single skeletal muscle cell. Muscle cells fuse, the blue dots here are uh, the many nuclei that, have, um, that are contributed from the many cells that fuse to form a muscle fiber. And so yeah, very different functions all our cells have. Now a stem cell, in contrast to having these specialized functions, the first thing that's true for all stem cells is that they are unspecialized. They actually can't perform any specific function that our body uh, needs to perform. Second fact or uh, definition, part of the definition of stem cells is that they can self-renew. Um, which means that um, you all are aware that cells, of course, divide uh, to make more cells. That's how we st all start out as a single cell and ultimately become this uh, large organism with uh, many cells. So all many cells divide, and that's true for stem cells. But, and I'll try, and, and, and uh, as I go on, to explain a, a little bit more detail what we really need, mean by self-renewal, but the point is, that this unspecialized cell that's going to be always blue in my talk with a, a green nucleus, when it divides, it makes sure that it always gives rise to at least one new stem cell. That's cell renewal. And you'll see in a moment how that is different from other cells. So it either divides symmetrically and makes two stem cells, or it divides asymmetrically, where one daughter cell is a stem cell and the second daughter cell goes on um, to become something else. And that's what these other, these other cells, they're called progenitor cells, do. And that's the third feature of stem cells, which is that although they are unspecialized, through the production of these progenitor cells, which go on to change further, they are able to give rise to the mature specialized cells of our body. Um, and so just to summarize uh, these um, three facts about stem cells, they are unspecialized. They can self-renew, they never run out, 
and they give rise to uh, the mature specialized cells of our body, also called uh, differentiated cells. Um, now there are many different types of stem cells and actually if you talk uh, to different scientists you'll find that some might um, uh, define a certain cell population as a, as a stem cell population and others do not. And often, although science is you know, trying to be very accurate, we do have a lot of definitions and, um, and you know, some of them are uh, debatable or debated. And so but what I'm going to do now is basically focus on three very different types of stem cells in terms of um, where you can find them and what they do. And you, and, and you know, part of, you know, you'll see, as you know, stem cells are covered in the press a lot. There's lots of hope out there that they might perform uh, or become um, drugs that, um, or treatments that can cure all kinds of diseases. There's lots of controversy about them, which is mostly related to embryonic stem cells. And, um, and there are stem cell clinics out there, we can talk about that, that, that perform unproven uh, tr treatments. But in order to really understand what all that is about, what I'm gonna do is explain to you what adult stem cells are, what embryonic stem cells are, where they come from, and then there's a new class of stem cells that many of you probably have heard of. They've made the press many times also. They're called induced pluripotent stem cells. Okay, so I'm gonna spend the next few slides just talking about adult stem cells. Very, it's actually a very diverse class of, of cells uh, in itself, as you'll see in a moment. Uh, but the principle is, is the following. In all of us, we have all these differentiated specialized cells that I was talking about, but most of our organs also harbor stem cells. And I've depicted them just in these blue little dots in our muscle, in our heart, in our gut, in our blood system. We have stem cells that are currently at work to keep us alive, as a matter of fact. These stem cells are there for normal tissue maintenance and they're there when, our, when we do experience trauma or disease, in many cases we heal. And uh, often uh, the basis for that healing is actually a stem cell. And so to really, I think it's a beautiful, one beautiful example of a well-studied stem cell in the adult body are the stem cells of our gut. And so I'm gonna spend actually most of the time uh, talking about our gut stem cells because I think they really illustrate very nicely what the, the remarkable power of stem cells really. So uh, it turns out that our gut lining, the lining, just the lining of the gut that's, that's illustrated here. In the, so, if, so actually if you look at the uh, surface of the lumen of our gut, as you probably know, there are all these villi. Uh, basically the lumen is, is, is uh, um, uh, curved into these villi. It, it increases the surface area uh, of our gut lumen. And if you um, cut a section uh, through these villi, you can see there is an outside lining of the gut, and that's the tissue I'm talking about, this lining of the gut that's exposed to the food um, stuff that comes into the gut and has the job of absorbing uh, the nutrients um, out of the food. That lining of the gut in humans renews itself about every week, once every week. Every week you have basically a whole new uh, gut. and. At, um, and that's um, what I'm gonna explain, how the stem cells um, operate to make that happen. So here's now a cartoon of one of these villi that sticks out into the gut lumen. And the blue cells and some of the green and purple cells are the cells, the differentiated specialized cells of the gut uh, lining that do the absorbing. Most of these cells are absorptive cells and some, some are secretory cells, they make mucus for instance, they're called goblet cells and intraendocrine cells in purple and green sort of interspersed here. But those are the three main cell types of our gut lining. Now all these villi are connected through crypts that dip down below the surface of the gut lumen. So this is the gut lumen, it has these, uh, tons of these villi, and, it, and down there is a um, continuous, um, with this sheet of cells, uh, the crypt cells. And now they're very, it's very different down there. 
These cells down here are not involved in gut stuff. They don't absorb food. Um, and uh, what's down here actually illustrated in this brownish color sit uh, just a few cells at, each, at the bottom of each of the crypts, and those are the gut, um, the intestinal or gut stem cells that sit down here. And uh, these cells, ah, so what I should say, and I'll, I have actually a nice movie that illustrates this, but before I show the movie, I'm gonna tell you what you're gonna see in the movie. Um, which is that, as I told you already, these cells live only about one week. And these cells um, actually, and the cells die and get extruded from this tissue up here at the tip. And they get uh, extruded into the lumen and then um, uh, excreted out of our body. The younger cells move up into the top position and what's driving the new cells that have to be generated constantly is through stem cell renewal divisions down here. The stem cells themselves don't have to divide very much. They divide only occasionally, and they give rise to these progenitor cells I had mentioned. The progenitor cells actually divide a lot to make a lot of, to make a lot of cells that need to be replaced. So they are these progenitor cells. They move up, and as they move into the outside of the crypt, they mature into the uh, gut cells that uh, do the job of, um, so I think I need to do the job of uh, food absorption. Okay, so this is now a movie um, that shows down here one stem cell that's labeled in blue. So this is again the crypt. What you can see here on this side is that um, these are the progenitor cells, and then you see the little hairy things on these cells. These are the differentiated absorptive cells. And there's some goblet cells uh, interspersed here. So what we're gonna watch is how this stem cell divides and gives rise to um, a new stem cell. So the cell divides, it gave rise to a new stem cell. That's the cell renewal. We don't wanna lose the stem cell. But now one cell, the other cell, the daughter cell, is a progenitor cell. And these progenitor cells divide to make a lot of cells. As they move up here, they differentiate into the specialized cells of the gut. So this is the enterocyte that's food absorptive. Here's a sec secretory goblet cells. So now we have these differentiated cells. They start doing their gut job. And as, but, as in, but they keep moving up into the villus because as you'll see in the moment, as these cells are aging and becoming several days old, they reach the top, and once they get up there, um, they die and get extruded from this epithelium, from this uh, lining. But yeah, so the important point really here is that the stem cells, without these stem cells, if, for so if something happened to your stem cells, you would have no absorptive power in your gut anymore after a few days because all these cells go on to die. Okay. Now, th this is a beautiful and well-studied example of adult stem cells. Um, and actually, the most well-studied and longest-known example of adult stem cells uh, are the uh, blood-forming stem cells. So as you know, in our bone marrow, uh, our bone marrow produces new blood cells all the time. So very similar to our gut, our blood cells, which are illustrated here, there are red blood cells, but also our uh, immune cells um, are derived, similar to what I just showed you, from a stem cell called uh, blood-forming stem cell or hematopoietic stem cell that resides in the bone marrow. And this cell rarely divides when it divides, it gives rise to another stem cell and to, these progenitor, to a progenitor cell, which then divides a lot to make the precursors of the blood and then replenishes our blood. So again, without stem cells in your body, you would not have any blood, as a matter of fact. Most blood cells, I mean, there's actually different uh, length of time these cells live. It varies a lot from a few days to hundreds of days. But without these stem cells, you wouldn't have any blood. And then finally, the only other example of an adult stem cell I'm gonna show you is particularly because it's so pretty. I'm showing here again uh, the muscle stem cell. And this has been a muscle cell with all the nuclei fused together into one big muscle fiber. And what's labeled here with a molecular marker 
is a muscle stem cell. It's a little red cell that sits in the uh, lining of these muscle fibers. And our muscles actually don't normally turn over that much, but if you exercise or if you injure your muscle, you have to rebuild a lot of new muscle. And again, that's driven um, by these uh, muscle stem cells. So that should have given you a sort of a good idea of the power of our stem cells that we have in us. Um, and I now will switch uh, to explaining a very, very different stem cell population um, that you know, has lo caused a lot of controversy, and those are embryonic stem cells. Um, so we're, what are embryonic stem cells and where do they come from? So the story f of uh, embryonic stem cells actually starts uh, with uh, in vitro fertilization. What I'm showing here is an egg and a bunch of sperm that are moving toward the egg, and one of them uh, in an in vitro fertilization uh, situation, you will fertilize this egg, and uh, development of the one cell embryo will start um, and ultimately give rise to um, a whole human being or a whole animal. Um, but it, as you uh, I'm sure know, in vitro fertilization is a technology that's being used for couples who have trouble, have infertility issues um, for various reasons and can overcome that by having the woman uh, have her eggs removed, the husband or man um, donates uh, or, or uh, donates his sperm, and they can be in vitro means in a culture dish combined, and human development uh, will start in the dish. And so that's actually, these are images of, of human embryos that have been, the, uh, the development has started in vitro in a culture dish. Uh, you can actually see here two little circles. So this is the egg, and there's two little circles in here. One circle is the female nucleus that was present uh, from uh, in the egg, and the other one is the nucleus that was contributed by the sperm. And this is prior, this is an image of a fertilized egg prior to these two nuclei fusing. Next step is they fuse into a single nucleus and that's the beginning of the development of the uh, new human uh, being. Uh, this single cell then divides and makes two cells on day two, four cells on day uh, three, it should say here. Um, oh, it's, oh, no, sorry, it still happens on day two. On day three, more cell divisions have happened. And so the first five days of development, a lot, or actually the first four days, just a lot of cell divisions happen. The cells are probably, they're, they're thought to be mostly very similar still to each other. But on day five, something happens that now um, there are two different cell types in this very early embryo that's called a blastocyst. And it's better illustrated here for a section through uh, this embryo, which now has become a ball of cells. It it's actually filled with liquid here. And inside that ball, outer ball of cells, is um, a cell mass called the inner cell mass. And it's actually the inner cell mass of this five-day-old embryo that gives rise to uh, the organism, to the whole human being. So that's just illustrated as a cartoon here from fertilized egg, in this case, showing just here the eight cell embryo. Many cell divisions happen by day five. We have the blastocyst, and it contains these inner cell mass cells. They're called pluripotent. Potency refers to, and I, actually I didn't mention something important about adult stem cells. Um, so before I explain what pluripotent means, I actually will step back and mention that adult stem cells, our muscle stem cells, our blood forming stem cells and so on, they have the potential to only make the cells of the organ they reside in. So muscle stem cells make new muscle cells and other support cells within the muscle. Blood stem cells only make red blood cells and immune cells. A pluripotent cell, by contrast, potent means it's a potency. What can the cell give rise to? Pluripotent means that these cells can give rise to every cell in the body. So that's what's so special about the inner cell mass, uh, which ultimately, if, you, if now uh, the infertile couple, um, the fertility doctors actually, they culture this in vitro fertilized egg up to the blastocyst stage and then implant this blastocyst into the uterus, and when that happens, uh, the embryo a few days later implants into the uterus, 
it, uh, um, and that embryo develops further into a fetus, which ultimately, of course, is born and gives rise to a human being. But if a researcher has access to such a blastocyst, he or she can isolate these pluripotent cells out of um, uh, this uh, young uh, early embryo and put these cells into a culture dish. And these cells are called, these are the embryonic stem cells um, that I'll tell you a little bit more about in a moment, but I'm sure you all have heard about a lot about them. Before I go on and tell you just a little bit more about embryonic stem cells, I do want to make a point um, about where embryonic stem cells not come from. And I think that's often confused in the press and in opponents who are trying to um, uh, discredit um, the uh, ethical justification uh, for working uh, with embryonic stem cells. And although, you know, it's a big discussion one can have, the truth is that a human embryo has to be destroyed to generate embryonic stem cells. But what I want you to understand is that embryonic stem cells do not come from just any embryo of any age. So this is showing you, starting with what day one, the fertilized egg, um, the uh, development up to day three. Unfortunately, day five is not shown here. But the size of the embryo actually doesn't really change. There's a lot of cell divisions. The cells get smaller and smaller. And only after that, once the embryo implants in the uterus, it starts growing. Um, and over the uh, various, these numbers are actually not days or weeks, they're stages. Um, the days are listed down here. The embryo starts growing as it's implanted into the uterus. And eventually, let's say here by six weeks, you know, we can nicely recognize the forming limbs. There's an eye. The brain is developing. Um, so, you know, the embryo becomes, you know, recognizable as an animal or human being. And then for, um, uh, in, in, in human biology, a uh, decision just was made to start by eight weeks, the conceptus is now called a fetus. But up until here in human development, this um, conceptus is called an embryo. Now, if um, a researcher has access, which they do, uh, with the right um, permissions, to aborted embryos or fetuses, they can culture, they can isolate cells from these embryos and put them in the culture dish and the cells will grow and you can study them. Um, however, none of the cells that you can isolate from any of these embryos are embryonic stem cells. So it's unfortunately a misnomer in a way because embryonic stem cells can only, pluripotent cells can only be derived from a blastocyst or younger. Because in normal development, when the blastocyst implants and starts now creating the various different uh, cell types of the body, loses the pluripotency, the ability to give rise to all cells of the body, and they are no longer embryonic stem cells. So embryonic stem cells, by definition, are always um, derived from a blastocyst or younger embryo. The other important thing I want to say is that um, in America, in this country, in the US, uh, when researchers do get access uh, to human embryos, this only occurs with the permission of the egg donor and the sperm donor. Um, also, and, and, it's, and they are, as far as I know so far, have always been, um, these embryos have always been created for the purpose of reproductive in vitro fertilization. Did you have a question? No. Oh, okay. Of, um, so um, the um, basically in this country, actually, somebody recently did an analysis to see how many. Uh, and so uh, what I should say is, so when a couple undergoes fertility treatment, you can get about ten or fifteen eggs out of a woman. All of these eggs are fertilized, and they all let develop. Uh, to this blastocyst stage, but only one or two of these embryos are actually transferred to the uterus for the woman to get pregnant. The other 12 embryos are frozen. And scientists have figured out how to freeze embryos and defrost them, and then uh, you can attempt uh, more pregnancies with the frozen embryos, which is how if the first pregnancy doesn't work, you go back to the frozen embryos, or if you want to have more children, you can go back to your frozen embryos. But the truth is that in America, there are so many infertility treatments 
Um, and never or hardly ever are all the embryos that were generated actually used for reproductive purposes. So by calculations by, uh, by some people, there are probably a million frozen blastocysts in the freezers um, in this country. Yes? Are there guidelines for the physician to uh, limit the number of embryos that are implanted in the uterus? You know, I do think so. You know, I, you might recall how there was a woman recent, a few years ago, who had like octuplets. Yes, exactly. Um, so I will. I have to admit, I don't know if there are actually um, strict laws that now regulate that. But I think most um, uh, responsible fertility doctors will only implant one or two embryos. Hmm. I have a question. Sure. Mm -hmm. This uh, uh, blastocyte can be uh, go in a, instead of in a uterus, can yes. be go in a lab, like a, some environment like a uterus? No. So nobody has figured actually out. Um, and, and I don't, so I don't know. Um, uh, what's been tried with human embryos. I used to work in mouse embryos, and um, you know we can do the same thing that I just described to you with mouse embryos, and, and um, we actually, there's now, um, you can genetically manipulate the mouse embryos, and then you implant them into a mouse uterus, and a genetically manipulated mouse is born, which can be used uh, for all kinds of interesting uh, uh, studies for biological questions about the genes you've manipulated. But um, I do know from mouse work that you can take a blastocyst and culture it uh, for a few more days and it will start the further development that normally occurs. The problem is if you are not um, I mean, the most important thing that happens next for a blastocyst when it's transferred to the uterus, it gets access to blood supply. So as the embryo gets bigger, it, you know, up until now, it's actually been running, you know, without blood supply. So nu there are nutri enough nutrients in there to keep the embryo going up until the stage from, from the get-go from the egg. But now you really get, become dependent on blood supply, and scientists have not yet, for, even for mice, figured out how to make that properly happen outside a womb. Mm -hmm. Yes? I read an article last week about scientists using acid to turn blood cells yes. into stem cells. Is that a completely different thing than embryonic? Yeah, actually, it's very related, but very different. <laughs> I'll, actually, that's my next subject matter, and I'll get to that. Yeah. Yes? Uh, the villi you mentioned in the gut, uh, are these the structures that are affected by celiac disease? And if so, mm. is it possible that stem cell research could mm -hmm. eventually um, cure or at least treat celiac disease? Um, so remind me uh, what the symptoms, what, what happens in celiac uh, disease? Celiac is a... Is a, uh, uh, a, 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 a it's a, ah. a, a, a destruction yeah. of the of yeah. the villi in, yeah, yeah, yeah. in the gut. Yes. And mm -hmm. uh, some people become rather sick with it, and now mm -hmm. they're uh, uh, limiting gluten in yes. or actually yes. mm -hmm. getting rid of it entirely mm -hmm. uh, because it has had that effect. I'm just wondering if mm -hmm. they're even looking into mm -hmm. stem cells as a yes. way of treating that and maybe reversing it. Right. So. Um, I am unaware personally uh, specifically about attempts to treat celiac disease using uh, stem cell technology. Um, so, and actually, once I get through the next uh, cell type that I want to discuss, I'll get back to you because there are actually two very different ways uh, people are thinking about using stem cells mm -hmm. to advance uh, uh, disease uh, problems. And, um, and if I, I, I'm sure I can remember to get back to that. <laughs> um, okay, so I just wanted to make this point that there are all these frozen embryos in this country and, um, and researchers you know, have to get permission to use the human embryos to generate the embryonic stem cells. But what's so cool about the embryonic stem cells is, unlike adult stem cells, they maintain what the inner cell mass can do, which is, and this is, you know, doesn't do justice to the fact that they can give rise to every cell in the body. And from mouse work, we have proof that these um, embryonic stem cells, we can't do the experiments in humans, 
but you can create an, an entire mouse uh, with some trickery. Um, you can cr cr create an entire mouse uh, just from these embryonic stem cells. So we do know that they are pluripotent and can give rise to everything in the body. Yes? In one of the previous slides, you mentioned that the stem cell, when it divides, one of the daughters is a stem cell. Yes. So why does one stem cell not be enough for all the needs? Why do we need even two stem cells? Right. Um, I mean, that's a good question. One stem cell should be enough. Um, the problem, maybe if you just go back to the gut example, is that actually the way Mother Nature has set us up is you know, that these villi are, our gut is huge, and the villi you know, stretch over long distances. And the, sing and the cells actually don't move from villas to villas the cells stay within the villus. So each villus you know, basically has to be supplied by stem cells. Now, would one stem cell be enough? It should be, but it turns out that there are uh, five, six, ten, I'm not sure what the current number is that people think sits at the bottom of the crypt. Um, it, I certainly, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint, if you have multiple stem cells, if something goes wrong with a stem cell, you know, then you have some backup. You know, I think it's probably um, a good idea to have multiple stem cells. But in theory, actually, um, the ultimate proof that you have, that, that as a scientist, you think you have isolated a stem cell is actually, and that's been done with blood forming stem cells, is that you can take a single cell and repopulate the entire organ. So in mice, this is done by lethally irradiating mice. When, they're, when mice are exposed to uh, high uh, radiation, all their blood stem cells die. And, and it's called, it's a lethal irradiation because then the mouse dies if its blood stem cells are gone after a little while. And people have been able to isolate from another mouse a single cell out of the bone marrow. They've identified cell surface markers to pull out a single cell that they can put into the lethally irradiated mouse and it reconstitutes the entire blood forming system and the mouse lives. So yeah, a single stem cell can do it and that's really the ultimate functional proof that you've identified a stem cell. Can we do it in human Yes, we can. So, it, so the, human stem, the human blood forming stem cells have also been identified. And actually, I can you know, maybe mention in this context, um, I don't think anybody has tried in humans to use a single cell because it would be uh, too dangerous. And I, you'll hear in a moment why. Um, the blood forming stem cell is actually at the basis of bone marrow transplants success. So when people receive a bone marrow transplant, uh, in many cases it's because they have uh, blood cancer. And uh, in order to eradicate the blood cancer, it actually comes from the mouse research I was just describing. You know, we've discovered that irradiation can destroy the blood forming system. Now, if you have a cancer of the blood, if you could, if you can, and we do, destroy the entire blood system in a patient with that cancer, you're also destroying the cancer. But now the patient is, of course, lethally irradiated and needs new stem cell, needs new blood. And so it's actually when a bone marrow transplant, and people back when they first developed bone marrow transplants didn't really know that's what they were doing. But if you isolate bone marrow um, cells from a donor in that mixture of cells, there are some prog progenitor cells and mature cells in there, but that mixture does contain the blood forming stem cells. You inject them into the person who you just have lethally irradiated and these um, blood forming stem cells now find, they're, they're called niches, the little areas in the bone marrow where they are happy to live, settle in there and reconstitute this person's blood which is now free of cancer. So it's, it's really actually, you know, if you wanna know uh, if stem cell transplants can work in people, I always like to tell this story where we, I'm taking too long, <laughs> thanks. Um, where people, you know, uh, yeah, uh, do, uh, uh, okay, sorry, I lost my uh, train of thought, but you know, to get to your point, in theory, a single stem cell should be enough, but pe you know, people, we don't want to keep them basically without an immune system for too long, and so we need to bring in a lot of stem cells. Also, we mm -hmm. need a lot of transfusion, there's a lot of cell transfusion. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. and, uh, probably one person is not enough, we have to have 
fuel that they are matches with their blood. Uh, yeah. The so from adult to adult, it's normally one uh, bone marrow transplant is enough um, from one person. Oh. Cord blood, we were talking earlier uh, about cord blood. Cord blood actually has stem cells also, blood forming stem cells in it. And if you want to treat an adult the way I just described with cord blood, you often need more than one cord blood unit because they're just so small. Okay. Um, so the differences between these two, um, you know, I already alluded to, adult stem cells, they're multipotent, some of them actually only unipotent, only can give rise to one cell type, that's true for instance for the sperm stem cells, all they can do is make sperm. Um, the, the beauty about embryonic stem cells is they can make everything. The self-renewal is actually also very powerful in embryonic stem cells. They grow like crazy and as far as we know forever in the culture dish which makes them also uh, very attractive to people who are trying to develop therapies using cells. Whereas although we, from some tissues, we can isolate adult stem cells, but they don't grow. I already told you, they actually don't divide normally very much, and when we put them in the culture dish, they don't expand much. So finally, I think I should be able to get through this in just a few minutes. Um, the third important stem cell type I do want to let you know about is, uh, are called induced pluripotent stem cells. You now already know what I mean by pluripotent stem cells. Embryonic stem cells are pluripotent stem cells. They can give rise to everything. And sh oops. Shinya Namanaka in 2006, first using mouse cells, and then he and Jamie Thompson in 2007 using human cells, discovered really to the great surprise of scientists that um, he can induce pluripotency in adult cells taken from anywhere in an adult body. And um, if we have more time to chat, you know, I can probably convey to you um, how exciting this discovery is. And by the fact that he won the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 2012, just six years after his first description of iPS cells, it illustrates how excited the uh, community is about um, embryo, uh, iPS cells. iPS cells are generated by starting with an adult, um, differentiated, specialized cell, and Shinya Nabanaka figured out a bunch of genes. Originally, he figured out just a cocktail of four. We can actually get away with less now or with acid treatment. So that's where that comes in, and I'll mention it again in a moment. Um, uh, and, and, and force these cells to go back to an embryonic state. And they actually, from mouse work, we know that iPS cells, the induced pluripotent stem cells, act as well as embryonic stem cells in terms of pluripotency because, again, uh, people have shown that iPS cells, like embryonic stem cells, can give rise to entire mouse. Um, but we can make these from human cells and they, like embryonic stem cells, give rise to um, every uh, cell in the body. Now there was a recent publication just last week um, out of Harvard and the Riken Institute in uh, Kobe, Japan, showing that um, instead of genetically manipulating these adult cells, which has issues, especially when you're thinking about using these cells for therapeutic purposes, uh, they actually um, discovered that by treating and they, haven't, they didn't, haven't used adult cells yet. They haven't used human cells yet. It was done with young mouse uh, cells. If they just lower the pH, it's basically an acid treatment, quite drastically from normal 7.4 down to 5.4, um, and keep the cells, I think, just for half an hour in that lower pH, and then put them in culture medium uh, for pluripotent cells that within a week or so pluripotent cells arise. So it's made a big splash, and you know, that would be even better. That, I mean, already this method is so verified. There are so many labs using these cells, and I'll answer your question in a moment um, a, a little better, uh, um, for uh, research purposes. Um, but to, able, to be able to just change the pH for a little while and then wait just a week and to get these cells you know, would be very powerful. I just talked to one of our grantees who was in this field yesterday and she's trying to repeat these experiments. Nobody has repeated them yet. And so whether it holds true, we will know maybe in a month because this is so powerful that a lot of labs are now trying to repeat this. Um, and so if it holds true, that will be indeed amazing. That's it.
Those are the three types of stem cells I told you about, and I'm happy if you have more time to answer more questions. So I'll get first back to you, and then I'll um, get to you. What time do we have? Uh, we'll go as long as there's questions. Okay. Mm -hmm. Make sure everybody's still. Yeah. Oh, you can leave if you you know. You obviously you can leave if you're yeah, if you don't have any more time. So. I know very little about celiac disease, but now that you've told me it's about the gluten um, uh, um, mm -hmm. reaction, you know, reaction against gluten, and I don't know how that plays into the gut epithelium, the gut lining. But basically, when people think about using stem cell technology for medical purposes, there's two fundamentally different ways you can think about it. One is to try and replace cells that you have lost. So if in celiac disease there is a loss of um, uh, gut epithelial cells, in theory we should be able to figure out a method of replacing those cells. But I don't know that about celiac disease, but there's many other diseases that researchers are working on to, for instance, a uh, sort of an easy example is Parkinson's disease, where we know in the brain it's a very specific neuronal population called dopaminergic neurons that die. People have worked out already how to differentiate embryonic stem cells into dopaminergic neurons in the dish. And they're doing studies in animals right now, somewhat successful, uh, where um, the dopaminergic neurons were destroyed, and can they re recover the function of these animals by transplantation of embryonic stem cells turned into dopaminergic neurons. So cell therapy, you know, that's to me at least the most sort of straightforward and logical way of trying to use stem cells to repair damage. But with the iPS cells that I just talked about, um, we really have a whole amazing new tool set at our hand that could, for instance, also um, play a role in figuring out new treatments for things like celiac disease. And the idea here is that if you can take, a, and I, I think, I'm not sure, so if a disease is, has a genetic component where it's driven by the genome of the person, you can take a skin cell, turn it into an iPS cell. The iPS cell now you can turn into a gut cell because iPS cells can make everything. So you change the culture conditions and you drive the iPS cells to become gut cells. And since, since you originally derived the cells from somebody with the disease of interest, let's say celiac disease, you might now have a model in a dish to look for drugs that change the behavior of the cells from a sick person as compared to cells from a healthy person. People are very excited about uh, this approach, and within the six years of the discovery of iPS cells, oh, no, no, it's 2014, so it's eight years, <laughs> um, we, um, there are so much research activity, both in the pharmaceutical industry actually now, as well as in academic labs going on, to use that principle, to use these stem cells for advancing medicine. So you had a question. Before this all, all the stem cell therapy potential, mm -hmm. my understanding was that neurons, once they died, could, there, there was no ability in an adult mm -hmm. to, uh, to get new neurons. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. And I also thought muscles were in the same, and you're saying no, that mm -hmm. muscles could actually create new cells under mm -hmm. exercise and or repair trauma. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Actually, the heart muscle is a different type of muscle. That's more controversial. Um, our heart, um, and there's actually some really cool research by um, a guy in Sweden who uses basically carbon dating. Uh, there's, there was a lot of carbon, uh, radioactive carbon spewed into the atmosphere during above ground nuclear bomb testing. And during that time, our cells, when they were dividing, uh, were incorporating into the DNA C14. C12 is a normal carbon and C14 is a radioactive carbon. And he's used this as a trick to date the, the age of our organs. And so for the heart, he's found that um, our, according to his work, our adult heart only replaces itself about half of it through our entire lifetime. So the heart doesn't renew much at all, but our skeletal muscle um, does a lot. Mm -hmm. Because obviously if you mm -hmm. had a, a cardiac event mm -hmm. where part of your heart muscle dies, mm -hmm. there's 
Yeah, absolutely, and believe me, there are people working on that. Actually, if you do pay attention to the literature, or, or it's often the press will report things, there are, you know, I was talking about, you know, so cardiac infarct, a lot of muscle, heart muscle cells die. Could we just replace them? That's what you just said. That would be beautiful. Um, so for instance, embryonic stem cells, we can make them into cardiac muscle. The challenge really is to get the cells integrated into the organ that needs repair. It's true for the brain. It's a big problem. You know, you, you might be able to put the dopaminergic neurons in here, but they have to connect to other neurons. They have to respond properly with the right amount of dopamine release. And so none of this is as simple as just sticking some cells in. The heart is really turning out to be quite a challenge because all these muscle cells have to beat in synchrony. And yes, you can get muscle cells uh, transplanted into an infarcted heart. First of all, a lot of them die, but those that stick around may cause arrhythmias because they're not properly coordinated. So pe but people are working on that um, to make that happen. Yes. One last, ah, question. One last question, sorry. <laughs> but I'll stick around for anybody who has more questions. Let's say that there's a therapy that the patient needs um, stem cells. Mm -hmm. Do those stem cells have to come from the patient? Mm -hmm. Very, very good question. So as you probably know, this question really relates to organ transplants, with which we have already a lot of experience. Heart transplant, kidney transplant, liver transplant, the things that you can get either from a dead person or for kidney, let's say, you can get a transplant you know, from a living uh, relative. Um, and when you do get a, an organ from somebody, it has to be immune matched for first thing. But even if it's immune matched, let's say from a sibling, unless it's an identical twin, your body's immune system will still reject that organ. And these people now have to live on immune suppression for the rest of their life, those who receive a new organ. An embryonic stem cell, by definition, is not matched to the person who would receive a cell transplant that was made from embryonic stem cells. And so it's a huge area of, of research is to figure out how to um, either make the ES, the ES cells, the embryonic stem cells and the progeny not being recognized by the immune system or to train the immune system to accept them. And the idea certainly would be to have to um, also use some immune suppression, depending on where the cells go and how uh, effective the immune system is as seeking out those cells. With the induced pluripotent stem cells, in theory, you have a chance to make, and you know, this is really just theory at this point, but if you need heart cells, you could make induced pluripotent stem cells from your skin, which are identical to you, cells and repair your heart. We know we're nowhere there yet, but in theory, induced pluripotent stem cells could provide that opportunity. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.